University John Hopkins Research Collaboration is MUJU. And it was started in 1988 by investigators from Makere University, the late Professor Francis Miro, and from John Hopkins, Professor Brooks Jackson. And the aim of this organization is to improve the health of women, their children, and their families who are infected with HIV or affected by HIV. So our mission is to improve the livelihood of women, children, their families, their partners through research, through care, and training. That's our mission. So in terms of research, the way we've implemented research since 1988, so for over 28 years, we've been conducting research to prevent mothers who are HIV infected from passing the virus to their babies. And we've done this by different methods and different projects. The first one was to give the mothers some drugs to see if they can reduce the virus in the blood and then reduce the virus that passes to the baby. And in 1999, we had a breakthrough study that was called single dose neverapine. And why it was a breakthrough study is other countries in the world, like in America and in Europe, had already found an intervention that could reduce mother to child transmission of HIV. But it was too expensive for Africa. So this study that we did, the mother took one single tablet at the onset of labor, and the baby got one dose of syrup, and it reduced transmission by 50%. What I haven't explained is that for every HIV-infected woman, if you had 100, 30 of them would pass the virus to the baby. With this intervention, we reduced it by half. So not 30, but now only 15. So that intervention, enabled other countries who are not as rich as the Europe and the US to implement prevention of mother to child transmission programs. And we also implemented this program in Mulago in 2000 and the Ministry of Health also implemented it all over the country. We have three main domains. The first domain is prevention of mother to child transmission or mothers during pregnancy, their health, and the babies in the first month of life. That's the first domain. The second domain is the children who are HIV infected to ensure they get the right treatment, they adhere to their medication, meaning they take their treatment as they should, and they grow up to be healthy and strong and productive adults. The third domain is maternal and reproductive health. But all these are interlinked because obviously it's not only the individual, but it's their partner, their male partner, as well as the children who initially are young children, but then grow up to be adults as well. So we're really linking all those together. And the male partners, we try to involve them in the prevention of mother to child transmission program in antenatal. We encourage the men to be involved. We have a special men's access program. When you breastfeed, even if you've given yourself nevirapine, the woman, that you may continue to transmit the virus during breastfeeding. So we've done other studies that have informed WHO and informed national policies and international policies uh, that you can prevent transmission by giving the baby some syrup, antiretroviral syrup. We've also just recently completed, again, a study where we use three drugs for treating women like you would to treat someone who has HIV, who's sick, three drugs during pregnancy, after delivery, during breastfeeding, and shown that you can actually reduce transmission to less than 1%. So less than one of 100 baby mothers pass the baby onto the virus. And this is the current WHO guidelines. We've also did a landmark study showing that one type of antiretroviral drug is better than another drug that you should use, I'll just say, a PI-based regimen compared to another type of NRTI-based reg NRTI regimen. And that has been implemented in Uganda. And it has been shown that when you give that PI-based regimen, the children do better 
without changing the drugs they're on for a longer period of time. In women's health, we've also been able to do studies with microbicides or gels that women put to prevent getting HIV infection. And the most recent one you'll hear about is the ring. And when they put the ring in with an antiretroviral in women who are negative, it was able to reduce transmission by about 30%. But when you look at the science, it's the infected mother who passes it on to the baby. So some communities say it should be paternal to child transmission. So generally, that's what it is, parent to child transmission. But in the science of it, it's from the mother herself. Nzenina, Nizalomana and this is on a appointment. Kubanga ba amusomi sana ba muga manti omichalo na ino kumiro bulunje dagala obuta funaka ukanga bochi. I was eight years old. My mother was very sick. She could not do anything. So I went to prepare her bedroom, and I read her testimony. It said that I was HIV positive, including herself. When I read it, I kept quiet. I didn't tell anyone. But immediately I wrote a poem that was portraying my feelings at that particular moment. So I kept quiet, I kept on moving on with my life. I knew what HIV was and what AIDS was. But after 10 years, after two years, sorry, when I was 10 years old, my mother decided to come and disclose to me. I saved her a lot of worries and words when I told her that I already, know, I already knew about our status. So that's how I got to know about my status. I first found, my, I found it myself, but then afterwards my mother also disclosed to me. Of course I felt bad for the start, but I thank God and by the grace of God it didn't continue to come into my mind. I easily had to let go and move on with my life, with my education, and come for the psychosocial support as I used to do. Well, I started my medication and I do adhere to my medication. It's been 10 years now on, my, on medication. I take every morning and every evening. It's a little bit challenging. For the beginning, I was started on a syrup. I didn't like the syrup. I took it for one month, and immediately I came and told my doctors that 
I need change in my medication. I could not take the syrup any longer. It's, it tested in a very weird way. I even hated porridge in the long run because whenever I would take porridge, it would remind me the taste of the syrup. So immediately I was transferred to tablets. They would always break my tablets into halves because I was small, I was little, I was not eligible for one full tablet. But later on, after like three months, I started taking a full tablet up to now. I take my medication. I accepted my status from the very beginning. So adherence has not been an issue for me. I thank God for that. Uh, when in 2006, I've, I faced discrimination at school and I had to change from one school to another. It was a bit challenging, but I thank God I went through it. So discrimination and um, Isolation are one of the challenges that I've faced so far, but there is also an, an issue of falling sick. Before I was started on ARVs, I used to fall sick from time to time. Oh my God, I would always be admitted, getting injections and everything. But immediately I was started on to ARVs, I no longer fall sick now. Adherence is very important, and it is very key in our lives. Not only those who are HIV positive, but any other person who is taking medication. It is very good to take your medication as the doctor tells you. If you're HIV positive, please take your medication. If you take your medication, you're going to live a life like any other person. If you take your medication, your viral load is going to be suppressed. If I talk about viral load, I mean the amount of HIV virus in your blood. When your viral load is suppressed, you stand very, very low chances of transmitting HIV to other people in, each, in any other way that you may think of. So medication is very key. Let us take our medication. Currently, I'm done with my university studies. Uh, I completed my bachelor's in social sciences and I'm working as a social worker. It's my, it has always been my dream. So I'm working, I'm earning a living. I can be able to support my family. I have plans of um, being able to impact the entire world. I want to reach out to all the youths in the world that I can be able to reach out to because I know they are going through the same challenges that I did go through. And some are even going through tougher challenges. But maybe they would need to hear a voice. They would need to hear someone like me who has been able to go through what they are going through. So my biggest plan ever is to be able to share my life experience out there to change as many lives as possible. So currently we have a, a group um, called the Young Generation Alive and these are children who joined this psychosocial support group back in 2005 and have grown and are now young adults going to university and working as well as those uh, who are now in their teenage years. But we've tried to train them to become empowered and to have a voice so the group not only provides support within themselves, but they also interact with the community as well as other centers that provide HIV care so that young people can know that there are others who are like them, there's something that can be done, and also to help prevent other young people from becoming infected as well. Muji Young Generation Alive is a group of children, adolescents, and youth who are HIV infected but also HIV affected. We started when we were five children in 2005, but currently membership has grown to 200 children, over 200 children. We meet every second Saturday of every month here at Muju, and we carry out different activities. All these activities are designed and implemented by us. They have uh, group psychosocial support meetings. They also have a series of trainings uh, including life skills training and um, also training in uh, peer leadership. So when these leaders are developed, they are able to act as role models to the younger children. They've gone ahead to do uh, social responsibility projects on their own because they feel that they have received from the medical world, they have received from the care of their parents and also the psychosocial support. I believe young people, like listening to our fellow young people. Being that I'm a young person, I am I'm able to reach out to my fellow young people so they can confide in me. And if they hear me expressing myself, being freely, uh, I can actually uh, talk about myself freely. I can 
disclose myself because I'm not afraid of whatever will happen because at least I've been empowered. So a young person out there who, who is afraid can confide in me and share with me what he's not even able to share with the adult. And that, that helps me to actually help the person, the young person, to improve his adherence, uh, fight stigma and discrimination. And perhaps that is actually one of the ways we help them fight various uh, HIV-related uh, illnesses. Being HIV positive is not the end of the world. The world still needs you. And there is a lot to do in this world. Youth, we should always step up the pace and keep adherence as a paramount aspect so that we can suppress the virus and live a positive life. And we know that psychosocial support is very critical in giving new, a new face to the HIV crisis. To people living with HIV, if you do not give them holistic care and support and only address the medical and leave out the social and um, psychological bit, then you've left a gap that still needs to be filled. Muju realized this early enough, as early as 2003, and that is when we started providing psychosocial support. But specifically, we realized that children and uh, young people have different needs from those of their parents. They had talked about uh, stigma in school, uh, discrimination, poor adherence to medication, um, some had even dropped out of school, had become depressed because of the challenges they were facing living with HIV. And that is how we, the psychosocial support program came up in Moju. It's critical to focus on young people as well as the youth because they are the future. They're going into a stage of life where they want to have children. HIV negative children, they want to have marriages, they want to have partners. So unless we focus on them and help support them to have an HIV free generation as well as a long and healthy life, um, the epidemic will be ongoing. But if they're supported to be able to have treatment and their virus suppressed such that they can't pass it on to others, even their children, I think that um, the future would be, would be much brighter. Okay, we see this as a program that will be completely led by the youth themselves. So greater involvement of young people living with HIV, right from the planning to the implementation and evaluation of their own programs. Because uh, we know that they, are, they have the lived experience. They are young people living with HIV. Once we've given them the skills and the knowledge that they need, we know they'll be empowered enough to run this program themselves. First, we did a, a small study, which was not to prevent, but it was just a feasibility to see whether women can participate in microbicide researches. It was a, an ARV-based study, I mean, a gel which was being used by women and the tablets. So the women were given, a few women who were not at risk because we just wanted to find out whether they, it is feasible to have them adhere to the product. The women participated, there were a few in number, about 30 women participated in that research. And well, they did fairly well, but not as we expected. A few of them had the challenges in swallowing the tablet, and others had these challenges in, in putting the gel into the vagina. But then, as, the, as we conducted that study, they were preparing a larger study, which was to test whether microbicide can prevent HIV, this time using a tenofovir gel, tenofovir tablet, and truvada. These are ARV-based drugs, which are used in treatment of people with the HIV. So the study was a remote center. It was conducted in South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Uganda. For Uganda, our women actually liked the idea and they took up this chance to participate in the study. I decided to join the study because there are very many 
positive, uh, there are very many negative women who are still HIV negative and who still need, uh, who still have a hope like me of, of uh, preventing HIV spread. Yeah, so I thought that I could be one of the people who would come up and take part in this study and uh, see how we can, um, we can minimize the spread of HIV. The women who are participated were close to 3,000 women. So the results actually this time, when they came out, they were exciting. They were moderate, at least about 50% of the women were protected from HIV. Because there were two rings, the placebo and the one with the dapivirine drug. So the, the, pe the people who used the dapivirine drug was found, uh, uh, they, they found out after the, the results had come out, they were prevented to, uh, to some level of degree, which was tr trusted by the medical people, and they decided to bring back the, the, another study of, the, of this ring that will have the drug. We need to continue to support people, women, men and young people, to adhere to their medication. It's easy to start medication, we all know. We take, uh, they give us drugs for malaria, you take two, three days, you feel better and you stop. But this is drugs that you have to take for life. So how do we support women, men, children, young adults to actually take their medica medication every single day for 30, 40, 50 years? We still need to focus on prevention. There's still a lot of new infections happening in Uganda even though we know the causes, we know how HIV is transmitted, we're still getting a lot of new infections, especially in couples, so the discordant couples, a lot of new infections. People don't know their status. The second group is the young adolescents. They're the high, right now, they're the highest group that becomes infected. So how do we find interventions that can train our people to, for behavior change but also inform, improve knowledge, attitude, and practice to prevent HIV infection. Because if you don't have HIV infection, then you don't have to treat it, and then you don't have to deal with the challenges and complications. The research we have done, that the main thing which remains, once you find something works, is to deliver it to the user. The end user is a problem, is a gap. How do we reach the people who need this ring? Who will support us? You know, we have to go a long way into the community and find all the stakeholders so that each one and you yourself can play a role. So how do we support women, men, children, young adults to actually take their medication every single day for 30, 40, 50 years. If we prevent HIV from getting into the women, then the HIV will not go to the man also. He will be protected. And these who are already having HIV, they are being treated so that they don't, you know, they live a better life. But now we have hope. We have medication, we have more knowledge, and yet people are still not going for testing. There's no excuse to not know your status, there's no excuse to not be on treatment, and there's no excuse for us who are children's doctors to have a child infected with HIV. We must have an AIDS-free generation. So medication is very key. Let us take our medication. Let us own our lives. My life is my responsibility. Your life is your responsibility. Thank you.